All right. <clears throat> 69, or 69, also known by its French name, Soissant Neuf, is a group of sex positions, positions in which two people align themselves so that each person's mouth is near the other's genitals, each simultaneously performing oral sex on the other. The participants are thus mutually inverted, like the numerals 6 and 9 in the number 69, hence the name. This position can involve any combination of sexes. It is also the number of episodes in the Strip Poker Night at the Inventory podcast, except it's really more like 83 or something because of all the point fives and the point five point fives that we've done. But technically, this is the official episode 69. Congratulations, it's me, your regular host, Spananon, and also here with my co-host, the regular co-host, Namasp. Just kidding. We actually have our returning guest, Just Kidding. And I'm also just kidding because uh, Namasp has died. He laughed too hard from hearing that it was episode 69. He couldn't take it, and he went into the hospital for intestinal distress. So instead, we, we once again, guess who's back? Back again. <laughs> Our semi-regular uh, sub-co-host, substitute co-host. My main account is a Nord. Always glad to have you. And it's not just favoritism. It's because this dude just pumps out characters, and we have another one of his to talk about plus Just Kidding's uh, characters as well. So we will talk about those a little bit more in full, but if there's anything you'd like to introduce yourselves with uh, for this very special episode 69. Nice. Just kidding? Uh, oh, goodness gracious. Everything's ruined. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Good golly, Miss Molly. Uh, I'm just so uh, enthused to be here on this 69th episode, this illustrious 69th episode. I I don't understand why it's important, but... I don't get it either. People just think it's funny. I'm so happy to be here. People think it's hilarious. I don't get it. Don't tell anyone, please. But yeah, I'm fully equipped to uh, ramble on about uh, Roland Maria later on here. Uh, and fully rather take uh, unfair pot shots at everyone else. So, happy to be here. And Nord? I am also happy to be here. What did you say the actual number would be if we counted all the half episodes? I, I, that's not enough. That's just a guess. <laughs> but we have to have like at least like 10.5s in there somewhere. We kind of, we're moving away from that because there's really no point. But... <laughs> Good to be back on again. Uh, it, I mean, it, it used to denote that basically the, the guest hadn't changed, but we changed to a shorter format, so it doesn't matter really. Mm-hmm. It's the official, though. I mean, you, you know how like movie sequels get with the numbering. You can have like 15 movies, and then the 16th is number four. I guess that also applies to Kingdom Hearts, doesn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's relevant. I'll, uh, I'll get into that briefly, but um, it's good to be back <laughs> on again. You think I pump out characters? I'm pretty sure Just Kidding has at least two more characters ready to go the moment Roll and Maria get off testing. Because that's what happened last well, time. We've literally seen him make some. <laughs> They're in the works. Like that uh, ninja girl Yai from uh, Mystical Ninja Goemon. You remembered her. I know, I know there's some other ones too. You, 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 Nord, have, have another character in the works. That is true. You haven't true. even talked about your last one. <laughs> and this is with me taking a generous break in development for like a month just so I can have a little bit of downtime before I get back onto that testing grind. Let the record show that I, too, am actually working on things. I always have been in the background. They're just not on the agenda because they're not new. And, well, not officially new. They're pre new. Before we get into it, I must say, I'd like to I'd like to give a personal shout out since I'm on the Wikipedia page for 69 that I look up. You know, I feel like it's a uh, you know the the little um, sex position position drawings that I can't, really can't say that sex position drawings that they have uh, here. You know, underrated, underrated. They're not bad. You know, they're not like overly eroticized, but shit, dude. Like this is better than half the stuff on like. Uh, fucking gel board and rule 34 and all, all that. Just these generic people performing a sex act like it's 
pretty well drawn. You know, have you ever noticed? Have I ever noticed the artwork on the 69 page of Wikipedia? Just, I... just if you look up any sex position on Wikipedia, like they have drawings and they have very. I don't like... get my sex education from Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never looked up. Like, what the fuck is that? Oh, that's what that is. Yeah, you're just getting. It's getting. It's getting real heavy in the sheets, and you're like, uh, "Hang on, one second. You just roll over in Wikipedia. What you're doing, real quick." Of course. I don't know. I just. I feel like mentioning it. They did a pretty good job. Like, I don't know who the artist is, but they. 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 they it's. It's tasteful while like being, like it's clear and concise. Gets the point across, but like I guess you could fap to it, which is again more than you could say for a lot of fan art. Clear and concise. That is my finish. Are there like are there like any eight year olds left that don't know what sex is? Because literally, you just type it in and like it comes right up on Wikipedia. Couldn't tell you. Like gone are the days where you might actually like be confused about it, right? As soon as you know how to spell sex, like you should be able to. That's it. I mean, you don't even really need to need to know how to spell. There are kids who aren't even speaking yet who can navigate YouTube. So, I guess so. Who knows what they know? I remember I literally learned like what sex is like penetrative sex from just like an anatomy book, like a book about like organs and skeleton and shit that I had since I was like five. And I looked it up when I was a little older. It's like, oh, oh, it's right there. I guess that's what that is. Okay. It's just a very matter of fact description of vaginal penetration. I didn't think they have any pictures though. I can recall in school, biology class, just going over everything in a very mechanical way. And then because I'm in Northern Ireland, we had a religious education class, which then goes on to tell you why it's a sin. <laughs> do not do this cool thing. Pretty much. Absolutely do not do any marijuana or heroin. Do not be like this cool person. Well, we should probably get into it. Heroin? Let's 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 start with the character that you might think is the one we covered last time, Kilko. But you'd be wrong because it's actually a different Kilko. Thank God we split it up um, in the episode, so we weren't talking about them right next to each other in the in the table of contents. You wouldn't have to navigate between Kilko and Kilko, which apparently are the same name, except he just happened to spell it with a long O, even though apparently they're not pronounced differently. But this is a uh, Kilko Toshino from uh, was it Yuru Yuri? Which is like this slice of life uh, anime, um, and she's like uh, she like runs this like amusement club, and I guess like plays pranks in, on people and things. And she's the kind of character for, for whom like she would just think sixty nine is the funniest fucking thing ever. She would still be laughing about it like ten minutes into this podcast. And uh, this is a character, the official, like the the true official, like not joke character uh, submitted by Lil David. Uh, famous for uh, opening his dev career up with Wario in in last April Fools um, in 2022, uh, not the one that just passed. Yeah, he made Wario the the sexiest, the peak performance male of all time, and now he's coming in with a with an official like a Japanese schoolgirl, which is the only way to really uh, get your feet wet in the Spinati experience. I am going to. Oh, she, she's kind of still a comedic character at the same time. She's kind of like perverted and uh, and teasing, not quite in the way Wario's Wario is, but a uh, I guess some sort of similar vibe. I will let Just Kidding give his thoughts first. It's the only testing roster edition that we have that uh, was not made by one of the people on this cast. So this is a very uh, inside baseball kind of episode. But for now, Kyoko Toshino. Just kidding. What did you think of her? So, uh, I have played Kyoko pretty often at this point. I really enjoy her, uh, mostly because she's uh, got some. She's written hilariously, and you know I'm a sucker for that sort of thing. Since I'm happy to read many, many lines in order to read the many, many lines that I've written myself. But uh, I. It never. Her, the first, I remember the first time I played her, I was like, "Ah, oh, damn, this chick's funny." So, it's definitely a character that I get. I see. I get why little David is the guy who's doing this. I mean, it's right up his alley. Um, 
And I see, so this is going to sound weird, but I see a lot of myself in little David's trajectory here. Because we both kind of opened out up with a very kind of unorthodox choice uh, that was warmly received for what it was, uh, and then followed it up with uh, a female who ostensibly, you know, we'd actually like to get naked with to some extent. So I, I see maybe the wheels turning in his head a little bit about the choices he's making, but the Kyoko isn't like a full departure from Wario land as it were, because she's still very serious, very still not very serious, very seriously shit posty. That's what I've written down here. What the heck? Why did I say seriously shit posty? The point is, uh, I think the focus here has been more towards, you know, how is she, you know, how, how do we make them laugh? How do we, you know, how do we get them? How do we get those japes in? Uh, which, I mean, not a problem. It, she succeeds brilliantly on that front, I would say. Um, but I don't really, I mean, and maybe this is just a matter of taste. But beyond that, I don't get that much else out of her. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of, you know, when things get really nitty gritty, she's like... You know, if there's any sense of, oh, we're getting, this is getting exciting, or this is getting kind of kind of steamy. So it mostly stays pretty lighthearted all the way through. And it's not a crime for a character to be like that, but I think the problem is not once have I ever gotten that sense that there's even like just a little little hint of that, a little sliver of that. So, and I mean, I say this probably like in full hypocrite mode because I mean. Yeah, if you're if you're not into Bobo at all, I mean, you probably feel the exact same way about him. Um, so these are criticisms that I'm definitely also kind of leveling at myself almost. But also, I'm I, I want to give credit where credit is due because obviously he's having a lot of fun writing her dialogue, and she's a lot of fun uh, to play with. But uh, at the end of the day, it's like one of those characters that's like you may have you may have missed the big uh, eighteen only sign on your way in when you were coming up with this idea. But I think on the whole, I think this is like a very well put together character and uh, little David always has immaculate work for us. So uh, I look forward to kind of seeing where she goes. Uh, If we get any, uh, you know, we've got lots of vertical development on her being fun. Uh, Maybe we can get a little horizontal development <laughs> but yeah that's how I feel Nord I agree with her her stance pretty much um, she's generally good but she doesn't really stand out because she ha- she has her quirks to her like she has this very skewed idea of what is considered sexy which is the joke from her source from what I gather so, like, she does funny, like, flexing poses and all, and calls them sexy. It's funny. She has some interesting banter with other characters. But in her generics in particular, she only really talks, you know, she, she, she has that thing of only talking factually about what is happening. Like, I have good cards, I have bad cards. Aha, you've taken off this and that. She does have funny lines for accessories in particular like she she in a good way she overreacts to removing accessory items on the player and other characters i just feel like she needs more she could do with a bit more going for her in generic cases like hand quality and i agree with your assessment that she doesn't really you, you don't really get the sense what is she actually into here? Like, is she just here to joke around? Is she really not interested in other characters? Because sometimes it doesn't feel that way. But she doesn't really... She's not... Her personality-wise, she's not the kind of person to get flustered. But she's also not the kind of person to get super flirty either. At least, not in a conventional way. 
So I feel like she she could do with a bit more development in those regards. She also just generally has this sort of um, somewhat easy to fix issue where like especially later in the game she might only have like two or three lines in a given dialogue case that'll cover like one stage which means if she stays in that stage for too long she'll repeat herself every other round stuff like that can sort of easily be fixed just either by merging cases or adding more dialogue and I distinctly feel like now is a great time for David to put her in sponsorship, try and get a concrete list of ideas for what sort of things can be added or addressed. From everything David has shared of her source and like clips I've seen on YouTube and manga pages that you find out in the wild, I think he's doing a good job at adapting her from everything I've seen. It's just a matter of, okay, now is your time to put your own little spin on how does she act in this game as opposed to Source. Because that's the thing with almost every character is canon is one thing. Spinati canon is another thing. That's a terrible way of phrasing that. There comes a certain point where you have to develop the character outside of what the source material can provide you. I, I get what you mean. You're, you got to take that leap of faith. Yeah, David has to take that sort of small jump of like, okay, what does Kyoko actually do late in the game? Rather than act the same way she has since the beginning of the game. It's, it's a really challenging thing, because it's, it's tough to just get their source canon voice down. And then you have to you have to make that leap. It's like it's like taking the training wheels off. It's like, oh, I have a reference for how they act and how they talk in this situation and in this one, but this is a very unusual situation. And you have at some point you need to have a, enough of an understanding of their voice and their personality to make an educated guess. Mm-hmm. And that's hard. I mean, that's hard even for good writers. They can get tripped up on that. I got tripped up on it for a, for a long time, sort of. Uh, I, I, some of it was just like a, a voice issue or diction. I think everyone can struggle with that with their first real character, unless you're exceptionally good at like adapting to that early on. I know I'd probably, if I had the motivation, I would go back and rework a lot of Leone's dialogue. Like what? Well, she she generally acts as she should, but I also feel like I could go in a slightly different direction with her that doesn't really change anything on the surface, but would just make it a lot better written. Oh, okay. But um, with Kyoko, with Kyoko, I feel like David's got the foundations are all there. Now it's just a little push further to develop the aspects that aren't covered by canon, and he hasn't covered yet. I know that's, that's a bit... A bit it's a tautology. Um, boarding, tonight, please. Um, or please, this is episode 69. We have to look good. I know. Ah, the pressure. Um, we, have, we have to 69 live on air. Oh, God. <laughs> Hope you brought your mouth. Watch. I've been doing that this whole time. <laughs> Who's going to be the six? Who's going to be the nine? I know it's hard. It's hard having to, t- to take your dick out, uh, take the dick out of your mouth every time you want to talk. <laughs> it's called manual mute. <laughs> um, you mind if I say my piece? Yeah, go for it. I'm just repeating myself at this point. So Kyoko, Kyoko is a very funny character, very memey, um, and. And cracking a lot of jokes. And she made me laugh uh, just from reading her description, I think it was, or some of her early lines. I got, she got a laugh uh, at me very early on because it said, oh, maybe I should pull it up. Because I, I want to. She is a slightly unusual college student who founded an amusement club by stealing a club room long ago. 
Things are never dull when she's around because she makes sure they aren't. Yes, it was her description. So I, I, I chuckled to myself. A slightly unusual turn to camera. College student who found in the amusement club. <laughs> College, mm-hmm, yeah. Definitely not a middle school student with a middle school face and uniform. College, college, she's a college student. And then she says, like, really early in her lines about how, like, oh, yeah, I wore my middle school uniform as a joke. Can't wait to bust out that old middle school uniform. I'm sure we can all relate. I do that every Sunday. All, all my middle school drip, I still have it. Um... Yeah, that's kind of the Spinati equivalent of like step. What are you doing, step, bro? I'm sure I sure am happy to be here, me from college. It's uh I think Marinette does it. <laughs> I think all the like the My Hero Academia characters do it. <laughs> First of all, you know you can be 18 in in in, in high school. Like you don't have to <laughs> make that much of a jump. But I'll, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, Mari does it. I mean, Mari's dead, but yeah, she she like <laughs> is listed as a college student. He's dead in canon. Spoilers for wow! Omori. Spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. That bitch is dead. Um, Isn't that something that happens in, like the very beginning of the game? Though I don't know. I well, I think you'll figure it out until later. I, I I'm pretty sure you can put the pieces together early on, but like the actual circumstances are revealed very slowly. She fell down. I can, definitely, I can definitely put the pieces together early on because I have the most important piece that she's dead. <laughs> Was she in pieces? Do you have to put her together? Oh god. I don't have that piece. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna echo um uh criticism that uh you two said and also that I've said about other characters, which yeah, she has that fun, meme, jokey attitude, and she does that well. But it can be a little one note, and yeah, they just that's all she ever does. Even when you might think that she, you know, like something would get her to, to crack or to fumble a little bit or to get a little hotter and heavier, it's the combination of that and the middle school source material and her sort of childlike face and character design that I don't know, it just makes me think she's a. I, I don't get like an adult vibe from the character because that's when you're 12 and in middle school, you're kind of intimidated by sex, but you know a little bit about it. So you joke about it and you like, you make crude jokes about it with your friends. So that, that just comes off as very immature to me. And, and more to, uh, more to the point, what you were saying about how she doesn't stand out. I mean, I, she has her thing and she does it well. I think it's less that she doesn't stand out and more that like, because she doesn't get like personally invested in any of the sexuality. It just, and she's always making jokes about it. It feels like commentary. It feels like she's a spectator or, or, or an observer, and she's just like riffing on it rather than being a part of it. Because to be a part of it, you need to like really have something that you want to see and, and get into it. And I never really felt like she did that. Um, I will say, though, uh, on positives, uh, he's clearly, Lil David's very clearly passionate about this character. He, he has poured a ton of work into her, especially like graphically. Uh, her custom clothes just look really good. She has some detailing as well, but like I think he used a lot of pipelines to get like realistic folds or like uh, the tomato patterns on her underwear. I think she has a whole alt skin um, with a with a tomato or like a tomato suit. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what the reference is. I don't know what she has to do with tomatoes. She doesn't really look like a tomato. I believe it's just a running joke in the series itself. Uh, tomatoes aren't funny. They're delicious. Maybe if it was like Maki from Love Live or something, then I'd understand. Uh, yeah, like, there she is doing the tomato dab. Make sure to put that in the edit. She has, like, really detailed, custom, like, hand-drawn stripping poses. That's probably the best part about her graphically is uh, showing, like, clo clothes really, like, folded, like, around her arms or, like, uh, sort of the pleating on her skirt. It's it's very visually appealing. I've been struggling to kind of draw some some folded up or like half off, you know, shedding clothing poses. It's not an easy thing to do. 
I'll probably have to revisit it. I just I have like a working draft of it now. But those are her good points and her bad. There is a subtle detail that David went through the trouble of doing, which is that she has two versions of her outfit. A summer version and a winter version. And it's marker dependent. I thought she might. Is that a pose maker thing? That's a pose maker thing. You can do a lot with the pose maker these days. Okay, so that's not like an alt skin. Okay, so those are just like custom poses. But, uh, yeah. 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 She's always ta- And what you said before, she's always talking about like stripping and like the, what people are taking off with the cards. She doesn't make a whole lot of conversation, which again kind of makes her feel like more of a spectator. But she has her good points. And she's very definitely in college, officer. Yes. She just happens to be wearing her middle school uniform. You know, the older I get, the less the older I get, the less uniforms start to appeal to me. <laughs> Funny that. And they never really appealed to me. Ah yes, I want to go back to the days when I was being choked by a blazer and tie. I don't know. I mean even when I was in school, like I was looking around at schoolgirls. Is like, surely I can do better than this. <laughs> Posted this gif of her, and I must say, uh, I noticed something that apparently Lil David did not. Her hair should flip. <gasps> her hair should flip as she turns her head. The little messy part of her bang should be on the other side. What's up with that? Come on. You blew it. Everyone just acts like this is my thing. This, no, this is like a thing that they do in all art ever. All animation. It's an actual thing. I've started doing it with all of my characters that are... Don't they look so much better? They do. It, it really helps sell the expressiveness of your character. Now, if you want to avoid Spinanon complaining about this, just make characters with perfectly symmetrical hair. People act like it's just, oh, you can ignore that. It's like, dude, if, if you watched Dragon Ball and Goku's hair did not flip with his head, your brain would break in half so hard. Trying to figure it out. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think we've I think we've given her long enough. This uh, is already starting to drag on, and we haven't gotten to your characters. So Nord, why don't you take us through the door to darkness, and and weave us through the the many tales and 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 lore, and uh, and and narrative convoluted uh, structure that is Kingdom Hearts. Because you made Aqua from Kingdom Hearts, Aqua KH. Despite the fact that she's the only normal Aqua, we have Aqua Grunt, and I think you're also making Aqua Konosuba. I have done the art for Aqua Konosuba. My man's is currently writing her. We'll probably be on testing within a month or two of recording this cast. But this is the Keyblade wielder. We've gone through the effort of distinguishing the folder names preemptively. Let's, okay, she does have gifts. Okay, so she's not just like a whatever. She's not like a total side character, right? No. Um, I don't know what game she's from. Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> like, like which Kingdom Hearts? Okay. The one she's in. This is the part where I start rambling on about Kingdom Hearts, so buckle up. She's introduced... Do you think in... you can get it in like under 10 minutes? I'll try my best. So Kingdom Hearts is a series where every single game that like you think they're just spin-offs, but no, they're all integral to the overall plot to the point where there was like a 10-year gap between Kingdom Hearts 2 and 3 and there's like a dozen different side games on different consoles and you think, "Oh, I don't need to play those, right?" You do. Aqua is from Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, which was a prequel game for like the whole franchise up to that point. She's one of three playable characters in that game. The other two are called Ventus and Terra. Long story short, their friend group breaks up as everyone, as her two friends go into their goth emo phase and get stuck there for ten years. Aqua is then... At the conclusion of that game, trapped in the realm of darkness for a while, she eventually meets up with Mickey Mouse. She and Mickey go on to do like another perspective of a cutscene from Kingdom Hearts 1. She gets separated from Mickey, and then she's left in the realm of darkness for the next 10 years, 
and Mickey Mouse kind of forgets to tell anyone about her being trapped there. And so she's left alone, trapped in the Kingdom Hearts equivalent of hell for 10 years. Thanks, Mickey. And then, they, and then in Kingdom Hearts 3, that comes back round. When she doesn't go, seem any worse for wear. Yeah. Like, clearly she I think found she handled somewhere. hell pretty well. She handled it pretty well, because like, she's no worse for wear after 10 years, aside from eventually succumbing to darkness. But then it's okay, because in Kingdom Hearts 3, Sora goes and rescues her, beats her in a boss battle, and then she's okay. <laughs> I swear Kingdom Hearts isn't complicated as long as you play them in release order. But if you try to follow it chronologically, good luck, because they introduce time travel late into the series. (laughs) Anyway, all of that is and isn't relevant to Aqua in Spinati. Because all of that... I tried to weave in as best I could into her dialogue. And I will reconfirm it here. I am slowly working on an epilogue for her that is going to be full of Kingdom Hearts lore. And sex. But, but Kingdom Hearts lore aplenty. It is I going can't to have, have sex without Kingdom Hearts lore, okay? I just... <laughs> It's the only thing that turns me on anymore. Uh, Get ready for exposition. (laughs) Um, Okay. So I'm calming down now. Um, As my own character, I'm overall happy where she currently is. My main thing recently has been chipping away at new targets and trying to meet these weekly... Um, goals for a thing Andres is running, that little writing oh, challenge. Oh yeah, it's, it's been long enough that she's been on testing and is now on the main roster. She probably mentioned that, right? Yeah. She was the first character to go on testing this year, I believe. I think I submitted her like January 1st or 2nd. She's great. All I really have to say is that aside from working on the epilogue, I'm just chipping away at new targets whenever I can. I know there's some people I've yet to respond to. Uh, I'd well, love what to about hear. like uh, her like personality, or like what did you want to get across with her, or what did you want to do with her, and what do you want to do in the future? You know, why this character? That's it. That's something I can't answer. Why Aqua? Because of all the Kingdom Hearts characters, she is probably the most viable without needing a lot of head cannon fan on. She's just, and just, just generally is, like, is, was the most viable candidate for Spinati. There are other characters that are viable. Some of them are villains, like Kingdom Hearts original villains, not Ursula from The Little Mermaid or anything. Um, but uh, there's a reason I made Aqua, apart from really liking her as a character, is that she was just the most viable. And it's... People have praised me for managing to get a lot of personality across with a character from Kingdom Hearts. Because Kingdom Hearts kind of has two... Saying that it has two-dimensional character writing is a compliment. (laughs) Please help me, I'm in too deep to this silly little crossover series. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts about her. Well, like, what, what, how would you describe her personality? Well, the... <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> it's... The dumb, the dumb fucking thing is, the best way to describe her is, she's really kind and caring, but she's not afraid to get dangerous. That describes 90% of the Kingdom Hearts characters. Is she afraid to get kinky? Not afraid, no. Just apprehensive. Because going with the fact that she was trapped in the Realm of Darkness for 10 years, I've written her as being inexperienced. Because she wouldn't have had anyone to do that sort of thing with. 
But you'd think she'd be pretty good at uh, doing it with herself. Yeah. It's just that it's hard to make time for that sort of thing when you're trying to, like, fight for your life every day sort of thing. Oh, are there things to do in, in darkness? I, I was under the impression she was, like, in the void. We're going to be here all night if I have to explain the Kingdom Hearts cosmology. All right, see maybe we should just the, move on. Let's save that for the epilogue. This is a Final Fantasy Wait. game. So the void is like a really dangerous place full of monsters. Always, every time. Pretty much. What, like X Death? Yes, exactly that. Did she meet up with X Death? I don't think. Did she like sleep under his shade? I don't think X Death crosses over into, into, into uh, uh, Kingdom Hearts. He should. But listen, but... if you, Nord, if you want to cool off um, when we're done with this cast, you can go into the full explanation and we'll just make a note like, hey, Solitaire, you can just cut all this out or <laughs> stick it at the end for bonus footage. Uh... Just, you can just let loose. Just talk for an hour and then we'll just cut it into six, ten minute pieces and just play those all over each other. <laughs> Explicit. One hour of, of Nord 69ing with Aqua. Split it up exactly. into seven different separate podcast episodes, which are all required listening. And they're out of order. Exactly. Okay. If you have, not, if you have uh, nothing else to say right now, um, just kidding. What did you think of Aqua from Kingdom Hearts? You said that she's not afraid to get dangerous, but... Darkwing Duck isn't in the Kingdom Hearts continuity as far, as far as I know. Damn, you got me. I don't know a whole lot about Kingdom Hearts. I've never played Kingdom Hearts. And everything I know about Final Fantasy comes from playing Final Fantasy fourteen. I have never played a different Final Fantasy fourteen different Final Fantasy game within fourteen. But it makes a lot of references to outside of, of Final Fantasy and a lot of Final Fantasy references. You've only played fourteen? Yeah, I've only played 14. Laugh at me in point. What? Throw things at me. Why would you play only 14? You don't know what any of this shit is that they're talking about. Listen, listen, listen to me. Listen very closely to the sound of my voice when I tell you this. I started playing Final Fantasy 14 for a girl. Was that girl? Oh, you mean in real life? Yes, in real life. I thought you, I thought you meant like Yastola. <laughs> Start no. playing it to wife. Not your Stola. No, 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 no. For an actual real girl who I live with and had two cats with now. So you know, kind of worked out for me. But let's let's pivot and talk about Aqua. Just you know, I didn't hear what you here. said. You live with her now. Yeah, and we have two cats. Oh, it's turned into a commitment. <laughs> it's all. It's almost as much as two kids. Speaking of commitments, Aqua. From Spinatti. Back on topic. Perfect visit. Um, okay. I've played a lot with Aqua, Nord. I really like Aqua. I think she's cute. And I think you did a good job putting this character together. Um, the model's really good. I believe uh, uh, you helped make it, and you had some help with it. Yes. From it a... a couple of esteemed members of our community. It was a group effort. I I did the model and all of the posing, but Nomlet handled image attachments. He made her sleeves, the bits of armor on those sleeves. He's drawn the key blade and the key chain to go with it. And Zeus, uh, he and I did a trade where he did her hair and I did all of the basic posing for the nine ass art update. Nine asses? Sure. 69 s. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I gave anyone who else who helped out on this their fair shake because uh, I think it's, a, it's really a splendid model. Uh, like I said, I think she's cute. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Kingdom Hearts, but I... I don't often feel like I am being. She's saying things to me that are confusing to me, and I'm like, "What the heck are you speaking about?" I feel, and I mean, I'm a pretty dense, so I could be reading something I don't understand <laughs> at all, and will just like 
process it like it's real information I can understand. But uh, but so but if a moron like me can get get it, I feel like maybe the general public who has no knowledge of uh, Kingdom Hearts uh, will you know be be you know not lost in the weeds. Uh, and I think Kingdom Hearts has a reputation for you know that sort of thing. So I think that helps that there's an expectation that you'll be lost in the weeds that helps you, you know, maybe not get lost in the weeds. So I think you have a bit of a, I think there is a small crutch to lean on there, but it never came across to me that that was the case. I enjoy a good character who leaves their socks on until the very end. I'm one of those weirdos. Uh, So Aqua, Aqua, Aqua takes a lot, Aqua takes a lot of backses for me. Um, so, uh, I think just objectively, just a really great character. I, I try to think long and hard about mean things to say to you, but I don't really have any. Sorry. Is, uh, she has a much darker skin tone in this gif. Is that just because of the setting? Is she like in the desert? It's... At Does her night skin tone just vary by the- her, her skin tone varies depending on like lighting and game to game. In Birth by Sleep was originally for uh, PSP, I believe, and then she had her her own game where where you play her in the realm of darkness bit, and she was a bit paler there. I just went off of like official art that they um for all the characters so like I, I've lifted the skin tone directly from an official source I mean it's not a big deal I was just curious there's something you said that I didn't agree with I, th- I, think, it was, I think it was just kidding it's agree with me dare you oh no 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 it was uh, it was it was Nord I think I think I think we, well what you said was that her personality was just very flat and simple and there wasn't much to go off of which I don't know. You, you know, you know better than me, but I think if you, if you trust yourself enough and you're experienced enough as a writer, and I think you definitely are at this point with how many different characters you've written, you can kind of make something from nothing. And I think that like Spinati provides a really good environment to, to test your skills and to sort of strain the character to their limits they you know, challenge mm-hmm. their perspective and their typical shtick. You know, because you're meeting so many wildly different people in this very unique situation, and they have, you know, their modes of dress and their perspectives and their culture and their uh, opinions on things. It's just it's so radically different from whatever the character is probably used to. That you get you get. Uh, they're not just pigeonholed into into doing one particular thing. You really have to think outside the box for how they would react to that and all the crossover elements. And I think you've you've adapted pretty well. Like I got a, a decent impression of her. Yeah, she's not the most complicated character ever, but you know, she's she's very she she has this uh sense of like she was trained to be like this all loving uh noble defender against evil and but <laughs> But the way she talks so nobly about like protecting worlds and stuff just immediately like just <laughs> triggers the alarm bells <laughs> in my girl's heads just how like sanctimonious it sounds, and they just immediately think she's evil or like brainwashed or something. She's like, "What? No!" Like I imagine like almost everyone in Kingdom Hearts like is either a card carrying villain or a hero, and they just take whatever Aqua says at face value. So for her yeah. to be like. Yeah, so for her to meet someone who, like, she does her normal shtick and they don't trust her at all, that's a fun situation to navigate, and I think you did it in a really funny way. Just to, you know, to create those misunderstandings. I mean, that's a writing skill with targets as well, to, to recognize when there's potential there and to, and to run with it instead of, like, nipping it in the bud. I mean, it's improv, basically. Yeah. I really enjoyed the targets with Maya and Jura. I think that in particular happens when... Both Maya and Jura are there. They start assuming the worst of Aqua, and she has to like verbally backpedal. That's really fun, and I'm hoping to continue it. It's just hard for me to try and summarize all the little, you know, microcosms where 
okay, how do I put personality into this line and this line? I think thinking thinking about it, it's a lot of okay. In her in in Birth by Sleep, a lot of the plot conflict is caused by the fact that Aqua is made into is like officially called a Keyblade Master, but her like friend and like equal Terra is denied the rank of Keyblade Master, and that puts him down. A That's dark outrageous! Path. It's unfair. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how can he be on the council and not have the status of Keyblade Master? Take a funny, seat. Young funny Sarah. you say that. Ma- Master Eriquis was voiced by Mark Hamill. That's it's like their <laughs> Keyblade Master. <laughs> and and Xehanort was voiced by Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> so that was fun. Um but but a lot like a lot of the conflict in their friend group comes from the fact that Aqua while meaning well does tend to act like she knows what's best. Not to the point of being like very vain or anything, but just very matter-of-factly, you should trust me and what I'm trying to do. Sort of thing. No, that's good. Um, I have a lot of like other little notes about here, just generally positive things. You know, she's got nice hair. She has a really unique look about her, nice custom detailing on the clothes. You know, she does you know, she doesn't have a ton of personality, but she's cute. She's modest, but she's like she's not like overly embarrassed or saying she wants to puke like old Yang. <laughs> you know, she's she's still happy to be there. She's like, oh, you know, this is a fun little experience that I'm having, and you know, I'm a little embarrassed, but it's all good. Um, she she did a good job. I feared the worst with the lore dumps in Kingdom Hearts, but she really did it in a way that felt unintrusive. I never felt like I was getting lore dumped on, even if there was a, some. I'm sh- so like show don't tell. I think with Aravi, I like just you know full like full throttle. Just had Aqua very quickly try to summarize the entire plot of Birth by Sleep, and it just <laughs> does the thing where the text goes so long it goes behind her head. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is a serious professional, mild mannered, very competent. Uh, fighter with with short blue hair, so you know, pretty good, pretty good. Well, yeah, on a personal level, I must say, this really. I feel like I never really was cognizant of the cognizant of this before, but I kind of made, kind of made me realize, like you know, I kind of like it when girls are tall. I never really thought about it that way, but isn't she like five ten or something like that? I think that's what her listed height is. She's she's pretty tall in game, right? Yeah, five ten. Five ten. I'm not into like giantesses necessarily that like tower over you, <laughs> but just like kind of generally above average height. It's like I don't know. I think it looks good. Nice, slender, long legs. I like that look. It also made me realize that like just a uh, character writing Jura. She probably has a thing for the for the serious types. Eventually, she kind of comes around on Aqua and is like, hmm, I like the cut of this girl's jib. I like how serious she is. We should do a custom thing together. On a random note, yes, legs. She, she is like 50% leg. And that is taken straight from source material where like she's just very tall, quite slim, very hot. That's good. Fifty percent leg is good. It's honestly not that far off from like actual human proportions. Like <laughs> a lot of Kisuke models are have like torsos that are too long. That's a good general uh-huh. artistic tip. Make your legs long and make your torso short because if your legs are long, you look tall. You look like a supermodel. If your torso is long, you look like a dork. Anyone have any final thoughts on Aqua? When she walks away. She's on main roster already, so we're probably not going to cover her again until their epilogue, so speak now and forever hold your peace. She doesn't hear me say, please, oh baby, don't go. Simple and clean is the way you <laughs> Excuse me? I don't get it. Utada Hikaru, whoever she is, has a whole discography that is outside of the Final, Fe- Final the Kingdom Hearts. And uh, it, it's crazy. She wrote some real weird songs. Mm. 
I'm just then. saying this is good fodder for Aqua. Just kidding. It's time for your double feature. You have waited and waited and then waited again because we tried to get Namaspawn and he was busy and then died. So uh, we're finally recording it. Your double feature, Roll Casket and Maria, starting with Roll Casket. That's, uh, we had the original, um, we had a version of the original role, that is to say, uh, Dr. Light's helper robot from Mega Man, but she was built to be a little girl. And if you want to take the charitable interpretation, it's because Dr. Light doesn't have any children. And there's also an uncharitable interpretation, but we're going to ignore that. This is Roll Casket, who, surprise, surprise, has much longer legs and a much shorter torso. Because she is from Rockman Dash, also known as Mega Man 64, also known as Mega Man Legends, also known as Cancelled. A game from the, for the, from the PlayStation era that is universally beloved and like all Mega Man games will never get a sequel. Except for the main classic series. And is a game I should probably play one day. But uh, from those beloved games is... a. Uh, Roll Casket is, I believe, a pretty beloved character. Um, well, for one thing, apparently you see her naked on multiple occasions. So that's a good start. But she, she does machines. She is your, your mechanical helper. She, she uh, holds down the fort. And I like her a lot already. I mean, I like Mega Man in general. And I should definitely play Legends at some point. But why don't you uh, give us the formal introduction onto why you picked this character? Just kidding. Okay. Why I picked Roll. Uh, so, uh, a while back in the year of 2022, uh, if I may, was talking about Roll Casket, and he was like, I'd pay good money to have this roll instead of the other roll. And I was like, how much money? And here we are now. The longer version that doesn't involve me getting paid is... Uh, I when I was a wee boy, I love I love the heck out of Mega Man. Uh, I still do to this very day. I love pretty much everything Mega Man uh, that I can sink my teeth into. Um, and the Legend series is particularly near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think as a lot of N64 diehards might feel the same way if they ever played it, had that opportunity. Uh, it's a very different game in the Mega Man lexicon. It's uh, you run around as Mega Man in a 3D space. It's the only 3D Mega Man game that got it right. Um, and Roll is there, as Roll is in every iteration of Mega Man. And she helps you out. She talks to you over the radio as you delve deeper into scary ruins with ominous music. And uh, she is a uh, your source of uh, insider information. She like has machines that scan what's going on, and she knows what's up, and she keeps you safe. And uh, whenever, when I started, when I started writing her, and I was trying to find her voice. I I found it helpful to think of that voice coming in over the radio because on the N64, the voice acting is is very bit crushed because uh, you know it's it's N64. Uh, so her bit crushed voice over radio is like very kind of grainy. Uh, but thinking about her voice coming through like that, always it always made things click better for me. It's like if I can't, if it doesn't, if it doesn't make sense like that, then it's not a good line, and I should excise it. But yeah, I when I was a small boy, I had a huge crush on Roll. I thought she was really cute, and I didn't know how to uh, deal with that. Uh, but now I am here making her for Spinati. Because uh, she's a lot of fun. She's just very cheerful and upbeat. She is kind of a little oblivious to sometimes the imminent danger. I think that comes from the fact that she's usually very far away from it whenever it's happening. But there, there are moments in the original games where she's directly in the path of danger, and she's a little, you know, a little too gung ho about it, or doesn't seem to realize we're fighting for our lives here. But uh, yeah. I thought, you know, if I was, as well as long as I'm getting paid, I might as well do a good job of it. And uh, I really liked Roll, and it was good to have a uh, excuse to make her. You didn't need an excuse. <laughs> I didn't need one, but it was nice to have one. So, 
Isn't I mean, is there anything you were that you wanted to do with her specifically, or anything that you were worried like wasn't going to get across? And uh, like, where do you want to go with her? I, like many people, was absolutely devastated by the cancellation of Mega Man Legends Three. I still go to regular therapy to cope with the pain of that loss. Um, so for me, one of my kind of driving, you know, motivations here was like I can, I can pick up the torch and and carry it forward into the future. I can, I can kind of imagine in my own little way a a life beyond the cliffhanger at the end of Mega Man Legends Two. Um, so. I wanted to get across, like you know, that she's still, still a huge nerd, and still is very much thinking about, you know, building things. Um, but also, you know, that she, her, her, her de facto uh, love interest was up on the moon and could not be retrieved for a very long period of time, and you know what that does to a person's, you know, uh, outlook on love and sex. Like you're just down there on Earth, and it's like, man, my only prospect for getting laid is on the moon. How do I? What do I? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? He does machines. So, yeah. Was the, he? Was he? Was he left on the moon as the result of the cliffhanger? I mean, that is the cliffhanger. Is that he's on the moon, and we gotta <laughs> get him back. <laughs> When they were when they were developing Mega Man Legends three, when they were still doing that, they were like, "Hey fans, help us build our rocket to the moon." That was that was the whole thing. That was the the cute little gimmick. But uh, we never succeeded in building that rocket, so it's just like, well, I guess he's stuck there. There's a good canon reason for why it might take a very long time, because uh, Roll is working with uh, Tron Bon, another fan favorite from Legend series. And they hate each other, and they uh, probably can't get along long enough to string one good invention together. So it probably took them a very long time to, you know, stop sabotaging each other and build a functioning rocket to the moon. Isn't it kind of a thing that like rocket rockets and like space travel is sort of a lost technology in Mega Man? Yeah, um, you have like you have all like the orbital please. elevators and stuff that they do and. Space stations, but not rockets. Yeah, I guess, there rockets. Uh, I guess there was a rocket in X Five. What happened to that? Yeah, there's. It's very strange because the whole Mega Man, like, because every Mega Man game is in the same continuity, except the Battle Network stuff is not. Uh, they're on the same continuity, and Mega Man Legends is like way super in the future, even beyond Zero and ZX. Um, but uh, the, yeah, for, it's, it's beyond the cliffhanger that broke my heart as a kid, which was ZX Advent. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, the there's not a whole lot of space exploration in those games, despite how advanced a society they are. Because obviously they have all these sentient robots. It's just like, why would we go to space? We have sentient robots to, you know, wash our patios. We're good here, I guess. Burn our cities down. <laughs> yeah, but that only happens like once every X years, so... It's all good. Sort of. Actually, it goes horribly wrong, because humanity does eventually go extinct to their own hubris. But, you know, it, 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 that's just what happens. Anything else to say? Can we move on to Nord? Um, I guess my final thoughts would be uh, she's very close to being on the main roster at this point. Uh, as, of the, as of this taping, she only needs one more sponsor. So, uh, if you're listening to this and I still don't have that one sponsor. I'm probably running around the forum. I'm probably running around the discord server right now, attacking anyone I can get to make me a sponsorship. So hopefully it hasn't come to that. And it's a very peaceful place. Go sponsor her or celebrate her sponsorship. Cause it'll probably be done by the time you're listening. Yeah. 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 But, uh, but yeah, that's all. That's all I have to say, uh, to, that's all I have to ramble on about for now. So uh, Nord can uh, commence with his attack on my on my character <laughs> and my hard work. Um, just to, what consoles did the Mega Man Legends games come out on? 
Mega Man Legends, the first one, came out on the Nintendo 64, and then Mega Man Legends 2 came out on the PS Double Ballin'. <laughs> Mega-, Mega Man in general is one of those series I've never gotten into because growing up I never had the right consoles for them. And I only just recently learned about the whole it's all in the same continuity thing. I knew it before, you just explained it there. Um, so my impressions of Roll are essentially as an outsider to the Mega Man franchise. And I want to say, you did a really good job with this wrench, wench archetype. I had to make sure I said it right. Love a good engineer, Tom Boy. You did really, go- you did really good injecting personality into pretty much every. Is line. she really a tomboy? She does machines, but she's I don't know, she's pretty feminine or like kind of sheepish. Is she tagged as tomboy? Machinery is considered. She's tagged as tomboy. Machinery mm-hmm. and doing mechanical stuff is considered a male-dominated pastime. And that is what qualifies one as a to- as a tomboy to be a female within a uh, male dominated sphere. It's just usually you know that sphere is sports or punching people. I, I just meant like in terms of personality. There's not really. I mean, I would argue there's not like a an inherent personality to a tomboy. I think tomboy is more of like a, a way of life than a mindset. But I mean, <laughs> you're free to disagree. You're, you're free to disagree on that point. Uh, Hex didn't uh, get rid of her tomboy tag, so I felt justified in uh, my decision. I'm trying to think of how to critique so that I'm not just showering you with uh, praise for her. I felt. I, I want to say she had a lot of repeat dialogue once the game was over from her perspective, like once she was completely out. But it wasn't repeating too much. You did a really good job with her art, by the way, uh, in all stages. I think it's sort I love of... It, yeah. she, she's a really good example of what a modern Spinati model would look like at all stages, you know, the, the typical one. Not these ones that are pushing the upper limit of 15 megabytes using custom poses for everything just to squeeze everything in. I hope it makes sense in what I'm saying that, like, as a standard Spinati model, showing what can, what's possible, feasible, and what looks good these days. You know. If I can interject, because I never interject. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, to that point, like, this is not, like, a super complicated, detailed model. There are lots, lots of little nice things. Like, I'm, ta- I'm talking about mostly, like, nude. Like, the nude body. It's not the most complicated model ever. Like, her hair is not uh-huh. that complicated, besides, like, the shading. Like, I can see the hair pieces, you know. They're spikes, mostly. But, like, the shading... Just the, the little gradient she has, it's well done. Helps sell the depth. There's shine on her body. She has custom boobs that give a, a little more depth. And she has, like, some unique, fun body quirks. Like, her nipples are kind of big, even though her boobs are small. And it's just... It's just little, little things go a long way in just making a character look unique. And obviously, her proportions are appropriately leggy. Go figure. She looks sexy because her legs are long. Take note. Always, always lengthen those legs. Yeah. yeah, you don't. You you never have to go overboard with the nude stages, but there's a lot of modern details like custom body detailing that goes a long way to take taking like the single step away from Kisuke default that makes it go from like fine to actually like good. Like if you assuming you can enjoy this. I don't want to say Kisuke style, but it is a style. If you can enjoy it at all, custom body detailing helps with that. And I think Roll is like a great example of how the little details come together to make it really pop. Good job. 
Anything else? I just want to ask. I want to ask you. Do you have anything else, like really planned for her? Like anything big? Any big interactions or anything else? Do you plan to give her a collectible, for example? Oh, okay, maybe that's a bit small, but do you plan to give her a collectible? I mean, I like collectibles. I I desperately want to do more of them. I just they just a. Uh, there's so much effort involved in putting them together, and the thing, the thing I think maybe people don't realize about me is I'm a very low effort kind of person. I will hit the bare minimum and then uh, stop there. So the fact that I, if I, if I'm putting a lot of effort into something, it means I'm having, I mean, I'm enjoying it, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, and I do enjoy collectibles a lot. I, I really enjoyed making all of Shola's little collectibles. So I want to do kind of the same thing for Roll uh, and for Maria and maybe even Kaz and any other character going forward that I make uh, kind of in that same vein where there's kind of like a theme to what the collectibles are. Uh, and then you go in and there's a little accompanying fun little image that goes along with them. And uh and one day I dream that you can unlock a costume by unlocking a collectible. I will hold uh, Yustola alt hostage up until that point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I uh, I definitely want to do a collectible. Uh, perhaps in celebration of hitting my last sponsorship, I'll, I'll let y'all have one of those. And uh, uh, beyond that, uh, I don't have anything huge planned uh, in the immediate future. Uh, I I would love I I have plans to make another Mega Man franchise character, and I feel like those two specific characters could have a lot to talk about. So there may be more to that, uh, but you know, at, for now I am just I'm more than happy to you know be responding to targets and looking into new little scenarios. I can I can uh, I can. Uh, attack. Uh, just kind of the same thing I do with uh, everyone, all of my characters, except Fernando, who I have thrown his uh, his folder into a, a, a pile and forget about it for 364 days out of a year. So yeah, uh, I guess the short answer is nothing huge, maybe collectible, but you know, just sail, sail on more lines. One of my uh, spinati white whales is a uh... Sort of, sort of like a, a robot girl. Like, uh, very specifically the idea of, like, a girl that's meant to be, like, just... Like, she's like a robot, but she's basically meant to be a, a person. Sort of like a reploid, uh, if you're uh, familiar with Mega Man. So, it's funny how we keep uh, dancing around that in different ways, because Roll technically is, like, sort of a robot. Or you may be shocked. She's she's what's known as like a carbon. I think I haven't played Legends, but like they're basically in, people, but also basically robots. Yeah. And the, she could like take off her arms, and it wouldn't be a big deal. So so yeah, let me let me explain a little bit about that I, I, as as someone who's <laughs> like you know played the game and has seen the lore and so forth. Uh, I'll, but, I'll uh, say I don't I don't remember her mentioning that in her hand dialogue. Real, real quick, the point I was making about that is that um, legends exist so far in the future that humans and robots have basically become indistinguishable. So my whole thing with a robot girl still isn't technically there because she might as well be a human in most instances. <laughs> but um, regardless, go ahead and, and explain the, the yeah. lore a little bit. You can do a yeah, better just job. So, yeah, uh, so, in, so throughout the continuity of Mega Man games, uh, humanity seems to be losing. On, it seems to be on a losing war with its own progress, where it keeps like creating all this really sophisticated technology that keeps on screwing them over. Um, and that comes to a head somewhere between uh, ZX Advent and the first Mega Man Legends game, and humanity goes extinct entirely. There is enough DNA to make one last human and then there's like the humans put a system in place that should resurrect that's going to resurrect humanity one day 
So they make one human. He's like a mortal who lives on the moon. And in order to like, you know, keep the earth inhabitable, they create carbons who are essentially the same as humans. Uh, only, you know, they're not, ex- they're not biologically exactly the same as humans so that they can populate the planet and kind of just, you know, keep it, keep it in good shape for the return of humanity. Uh, but this last human, he's like, he goes down to Earth with Mega Man to check it out. And he's like, the Carpins are like living good lives down here. We don't need to like destroy them all to restore humanity. Let's just let them live here. And he uh, blows up the system. And it's uh, and then Mega Man goes into a hole and becomes a slime boy for a while. But that's, that's, that's immaterial right now. Um, but yeah, Carbons, uh, they seem to be some mixture of, you know, organic material and what is presumably nanotechnology so they can uh a lot of carbons have like mechanical parts they have like mechanical eyes or they'll have a mechanical arm they seem to be more easily able to interface with machines than you know a normal human is kind of the giveaway that something's up here so you know like a mega man's whole arm comes off and he can just roll can slap a cannon onto it uh, and that's not unusual. People just do that. Uh, so obviously, they're not humans. But uh, not obviously, they're not humans. Anyway, my point was, I think you could go an entire game of Spinati with Roll and not realize that she's technically a robot. Maybe throw that in somehow. You could, you could explore it in targets. Yeah. It's, it's almost a shame because... Uh, that might be a, a, a conversation you might have to end up repeating a lot. Like, oh, MGs, oh my God, you're a robot. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm going to move things along here because she's gotten a ton of praise. Uh, we we've praised her already. She's very cute. Um, similar to Aqua, I think she also does the lore thing really well. It's pretty seamless and unintrusive. It feels natural when she brings it up. Could do some stuff with the carbons. She's got a nice tight outfit, nice tight body. Nice detailing, cute big nipples. She she has a charming sort of meekness to her. She has a positive energy where she's excited, but she can also get a little flustered and uh, jumpy at times because, you know, like you said, she's not used to being in direct danger. I think I saw that because I played her with Maria and she <laughs> Maria kind of started bullying her. <laughs> but that's probably our cue to, to transition into Maria our final uh, testing roster edition for this episode. From Arakawa under the bridge. Arakawa under the bridge, which is apparently Arakawa. a bunch of hobos living under a bridge. I thought it was just, I thought it was about just Maria, but no, she's not even like the main character. There's like a whole bunch of them. There's like a guy who dresses as a nun. It's all sorts of shit. She's just one of a motley crew. Uh, he's doing research, at least a little research. But yes, uh, gosh, a dairy, uh, a dairy farmer who lives under a bridge and has, uh, you could say, mild sadistic tendencies towards men. Yeah, mild. Why don't you explain? Only if you spell mild with flames. Um, gosh, I would love to talk about Arakawa under the bridge, and by extension, Maria. I it's a show that I recommend to anyone who will listen and I can't think of a single person who's taking me up on it, unfortunately. Um but I love our coward on the bridge. Uh the basic plot is uh a guy, Ko Ichinomia, who is rich and powerful for a man his age, is on a bridge one day when some young rapscallions steal his pants and hang them from the bridge. He tries to get them back, but falls in the river and almost dies. He's rescued by a girl who lives under the river named Nino. And in order to pay her back, he becomes her lover at her request. And so he lives under the bridge and meets all the other wackadoos who live down there. Not realizing the whole time that he also is kind of a wackadoo and belongs there with them. But uh, among those wackadoos, we meet Maria, who lives kind of off by herself on her farm with all her animals. And uh, the folks living under the bridge come to her when they need milk and eggs. And they do so at their their peril because she has a tendency to 
treat men poorly. And she clearly gets off on it. There's no there's no two ways about it. She loves doing it. She does it just for kicks. Um and when she's not allowed to do it for extended periods of time, she will cave in and uh be mean to women too because it's just the compulsion she has. She's done it for so long. Uh we don't know a lot about Maria's past from when before she came to the bridge. Uh, in in the universe of this Japan under the bridge, there was a war fairly recently, and uh, Maria was a participant in this war, ostensibly on the side that won, and uh, she doesn't like to talk about it at all. When the other character on the bridge who was in that same war, Sister, the nun, the guy dressed as a nun, whenever he brings it up, she silences him. And he shuts up about it. And, uh, yeah, all the men under the bridge fear her because they know that she will hurt them, both physically and mentally. Does she legitimately hate men, or does she just like being a sadist? So there are times where she shows restraint. She's, uh, not like, she doesn't like beat them to a bloody pulp ever. She just, you know, is a little abusive from time to time. So it just seems like it's mostly theatrics just because she loves to torment them so much that it just kind of seems like she hates them. There's definitely... She definitely doesn't respect them very much. Uh, So she might not, like, dislike them, and she may not actually, like, absolutely hate them, but she doesn't, like, respect their autonomy and uh, doesn't care about their feelings. So there's not a lot of respect for men going on. She's not a respecter of men, if that answers your question. She doesn't drink her respect men juice. She doesn't drink her respect men juice. She definitely does not do that, especially not in the morning. There's one episode where a a, a non-wackadoo from not under the bridge comes and knocks on the door to her farm, being like, hey, what, what the fuck is all this? And she breaks his spirit. And he comes, he comes crawling back to the other people under the bridge, and he's like, I'm so sorry for existing. I'm going to go home and never leave. So she definitely has the capacity to, you know, be, you know, just like break a man in two. But for the most part, she's just mostly like incredibly, incredibly vigorous teasing. So she must, you know, in some way, like the people she lives with enough to keep them alive. So besides the obvious answer, uh, why this character? And what do you hope to do with her? Like I said, I I really like Arakawa under the bridge. And uh, when I was thinking of, uh, in my long dev past, thinking about, you know, who would be fun to write for, uh, Maria was, like, really high up on the list because, like, Gosh, she used to just be there's there's no one on the roster who is just like so openly hostile at all times, uh, as Maria could be, and just like gleefully hostile too. Uh it was it the it, it she needed to 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 come. It had to be her. Uh I felt very strongly about this. Uh if if someone hadn't paid me to make roll, uh she would have been before roll. But I think as it stands, she was technically after all. But irregardless, I was heavily motivated by just, you know, her overall personality. I think there should be more mean people on the roster. And since at since that point, there have been some more some meaner characters, some nastier attitudes added to the roster. And they've always been welcome additions. So I was I was very happy to see that. But uh I uh I really felt like just that attitude and just like, you know, the she's this beautiful woman who, you know, you don't stand a chance with because, you know, she can't stop bad mouthing you for five seconds. Uh it is definitely a niche that needs to be filled. I was surprised. I thought she was like a on the younger side and then I realized that like how big and kind of saggy her boobs are. Is, is she like close to her forties or something? We have no idea I how old she's a veteran. We we have no idea how old Maria is. Uh, there's a 
in the original in the in the manga of Arakawa and the Bridge, there is a there are pages where like the artist has like sketches of the characters and then like has information about their ages and height and weight and all that. And on Maria's, the age is excised with a note that the author is too scared to reveal her age. <laughs> so we don't know how old Maria is. Uh, fun fact: Maria probably isn't her name either. Uh, all the residents under the bridge all go by uh, aliases. They're all assigned a name when they agree to live under the bridge. And Maria is probably... They're all like line-of-sight names. Like, they're all named... So It's all very obvious names. Like, the big nun... The big guy in a nun costume, his name is Sister. Uh, the guy who has a star mask on his head, his name is Star. So Maria, a very kind of innocent, motherly figure is Maria. But, uh, of course, line of sight, so it belies her true uh, impish nature. Nord, what did you think of Maria? I actually sponsored her a few days ago, so I was paying particular attention to her. She's a really good archetype that normally I'm not into, but your writing was really good that there were a few moments where I was like, hmm, that's doing something for me. And it's just her berating my right to exist. <laughs> Another case where you've just done really good all around. I haven't actually played a game where there aren't any males present since she launched. I think I tried one game where it was just women back when she first launched. I'm pretty sure you have, uh, you, correct me if I'm wrong, you haven't done that thing where if there's no man present, she starts insulting women, have you? The In, in the show, the period of time it takes for that to happen is like a week of isolation. So okay. there's, no reason, there's no reason it would happen in this setting. And Fair enough. I so yeah, I haven't implemented it. If it's something people like clamor for, like <laughs> make it so she can be mean to women, I might I could be persuaded, I guess, but at this point I don't have any plans to do that sort of thing. Maybe if the game goes on for like a hundred turns. That's even possible. <laughs> know, that's, with enough ties, anything's possible. Hmm. Um There is something I could critique which will involve a little bit extra work on your part, but if, even looking at the image Spinanon posted, she doesn't have any boob squish whenever her arms are crossing her chest. And I know they're custom, so you'll have to essentially make a second set of boobs to make that possible. Uh, I did that for Aqua as a late addition for some of her poses. I went back and added the squish in, and honestly I think it works a lot better for the character. So I highly recommend you consider doing that as well. It would probably turn out great. Aside from that, all of her art's really well done. I like the strip order. Keeping the apron on. Very good. Oh yeah, the, the side boob, the front side boob <laughs> spilling out of the apron, that's pretty nice. Although I think it should spill out a little more because there's really nothing holding them there. Real quick, I would just say, you know, she's funny. Good sense of humor. You always write funny characters, but there's, there's still like some meat to her, at least like she got the sexual niche, which if you're going to have nothing else, you got to have that. I mean, this is obviously a great choice for a porn game. Lord knows we get enough uh, subreddit posts asking for who are all the characters that make fun of your small dick. Maria it's always been be like funny. a fringe but very substantial like audience that this game has because you can choose a small penis and they all react. Maria to it. will make fun of your small dick. She'll do that. She'll make fun of any dick you have. Yeah. She'll make fun of any trait that you have. <laughs> Honestly, I, uh, for a long time now, I've just been writing like small dick appreciation memes or lines. Memes. Lines with Maya. She doesn't really mind them that much. Not that she really has a good reference anyway. Uh, I've not stretched my small penis humiliation legs. You know what? For for how um, for how intense and uh, unsolicited or unwarranted her male abuse gets, I was honestly 
surprised by like when I finally had to uh, masturbate or like any male character had to. I thought she was going to go fucking nuclear. And honestly, it was kind of tame. Like, like really, she just kind of giggled and laughed about how I was useless. And it's like, well, she's been doing that the whole time. This doesn't change anything. Yeah. I was surprised. If she doesn't already have lines particular to the male player, that would be an excellent area to add new stuff for, especially if you choose the small size. Just completely annihilate the player because that's what they probably want. That's a good point. I mean, I wonder how much further you can go when she already like calls me a maggot and useless and things. Because she can't like physically stomp on my balls. <laughs> but yeah, like honestly, like it almost seemed like she kind of she kind of let up a little bit on the gas towards the end. I was surprised. I will say um, this is this character is one that really clued me in on like how valuable it can be to be willing to contort a character's face for expressions. I posted this one here. I just got her, her cheeks puffing up to really sell the whole chuckling thing, and that's uh, that's really good stuff because it it takes a while to make, but it it really helps, and it's something I need to, need to try to do more myself. So I really like yeah, that, that expression is lifted straight from the anime, so I had to do it. It was I, I was like, I gotta do this one. It's, it's, it's essential. In general, she just... I mean, any character that has a, a distinct face is very good. She's got nice shading on her hair, and I think uh, some shading on her face, too, when she gets particularly nasty. The clothes are well done. You know, the, the strip order leads to some, some fun imagery with, like, the, the apron-only look, like you said. Uh, very nice custom boobs, although I think her, her nude body, other than the boobs, doesn't really have any detailing. Maybe you could do a little bit with that. She's got abs. So I guess all, all that hard farm living. He's an ex-soldier. She's got to be a little, like, you know, she's like a little oh, yeah, taut, a little limber. Mm-hmm. I really like her. She doesn't have a ton of lines, so that combined with uh, letting up a little bit definitely makes her feel repetitive. So with a gimmick like this, she she will start to feel pretty repetitive if she doesn't have a lot of different things to say, so maybe try to flesh that out. But on the whole, uh, well, you, you definitely get what you came for. And you will come for her. Art-wise, you could also maybe have her like flick one of her... I don't even know what they're properly called. The bits of hair that go over her chest. Do they have a name? I don't know. Sure they do. But like you could maybe have you could maybe have them like off to the side on one side for a pose or two. You know, maybe sort of in a teasing or taunting way. Like, oh you want a glimpse of this, do you? Well a little glimpse is all you're getting. Sort of thing. I don't know. Yeah, they're kind of in the way. Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely. I definitely had thoughts about improvements I could make, and I know I should do a boob squish. That would be a wise decision. It's just you know requires effort. Effort. It's a little strange writing these characters, uh, kind of the same way like Cosmo or Darkness, where there's a very specific. It's like sexual thing that they either indulge or never indulge, and you kind of have to make them do that on both ends. Like I imagine she would, she would never dream of actually like stripping and masturbating for a man, and she kind of has to. So that might be tough to navigate. Uh, you know better than me. I mean, my thought process was just like you know she doesn't super care about losing as long as you know other people are losing. Uh, cause I mean, she's, she's here for a show and, uh, if putting on one herself kind of encourages like more of a, of a, uh, she's really trying to get a rise out of the other, the men around. So just kind of, kind of get them to, to sweat and to, to be nervous and to be, uh, cho- to, to choke on their words. Uh, so she, I think she enjoys that part. 
she doesn't indulge in it normally because there's no context for it. But now that there's a context for it. It's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll play along. All right, we have gone on long enough. We have a couple more things to talk about, but I think they'll be pretty quick. Let's uh, first off, uh, characters have been getting a steady little trickle of, of epilogues, mostly simple ones, and Wasp from uh, the Marvel or like I think the Marvel. Earth's Mightiest Avengers cartoon. She got an epilogue recently. Uh, just kidding. What did you think of Wasp's epilogue? I I think it's I think it's nice. I think it's good. Um, it's not like a, a huge huge like a big story event like like one of the One Piece girls. But I don't think I think there's uh, this bar that's been set for epilogues that feels like impossibly high and i think this one uh is proof positive that you know if you just keep it simple i just keep it to the where where it really needs to be uh i think you'll you'll have something really solid and i did enjoy wasp epilogue i thought it was just like you know a refreshing little yeah i think that's what that's what I'm looking for at the end. If I'm really interested in this character, just a little, little extra something from him. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be nice. If just every, just tick all the correct boxes, and you know, boom, it's beautiful. Uh, well, the whole I will premise say, of this epilogue, by the way, is that she just like flies and in, she invades your home and like flies into into your shower and peeps on <laughs> you. You're showering, and she's tiny, and she's like, "Hey, what's up?" Uh, <laughs> you like jazz, <laughs> <laughs> you like jazz, which may be a uh, you know these actions they may be construed as a uh, as sexual harassment in some jurisdictions, but she's hot, so it's cool. I mean, if you're into it, you're into it. Just be into it. Nord, what did you think? I have always been saying that we need to normalize making simple and like slideshow type epilogues again because there is this expectation uh every epilogue needs to be at least 10 minutes long and have all these minute animations and it has to be you know 100 percent effort not to say that this was didn't take effort but it's a lot it's very simple in scope and execution and it does what it wants to do i think it's just overall, it's good. My only I don't complaint. Mind. Go ahead. My only, my only complaint is that the camera is not consistent between like the later slides, where you're actually, you know, doing the deed. Like it's done with gifs for like this two frame animation, but the gifs don't focus on the same point, so it's a little jarring. But that's just me nitpicking it a bit. I don't mind simplicity in epilogues. I do think this is a little too simple. Mostly in the sense of like, you see this animation. I don't know if you can put it in the, in the edit. But <laughs> like, again, a two frame animation for something like a vaginal penetration or thrusting is a, it's a, it, it's, it's not enough. You need a couple more in betweens to, to really sell the motion. It, it just kind of looks jumpy and weird. Also, I think it, it should be a smooth motion. I think the the hands are backwards. What? The hands are backwards. That's the next thing I was going to mention. It really annoyed me <laughs> because you're supposed to be fucking her from the front, and those are very clearly like backwards hands. I don't know how people make this mistake. Like, don't you do the pose with your hands? Like, you have hands. Use them. Look at your thumbs. Look at where your thumbs are. It's not hard. That was very distracting. So yeah, that's the other thing. Like, I don't think this was put. I don't think it took a long time putting this together. You don't have to, but you should definitely sweat the details a little bit more with some of this stuff because it can be distracting. But hey, almost any epilogue is a is a net positive unless you're making weird uh, uh, rapey fuda stuff. Don't do that. But we won't talk about that. Move your dick to the left. And finally, in our in our waning minutes here, April Fools has come and gone. April Fools twenty twenty three, and uh, we, we a bit of a backslide 
uh, this year, not in terms of quality, but in terms of um, quantity. 2021 and 22 were pretty chock full of, of April Fool's projects. And this time we got three, supposed to be four, but one of them ran out of time. So, so we only got three characters. Honestly, I think that's a healthy number. Like there's enough April Fool's characters now that it can be a, a little overwhelming to get a dozen more. And I personally think they were, they're all pretty solid. Um, but let's do like, you know, a couple seconds tops uh, opinions on each of these. First, we have, as soon as I, you know, collect your thoughts, I'm going to find um, images. We have Gigas from Earthbound. Son of a bitch, right? Like, you cannot grasp the true form of, of this character. And, and lo and behold, like, we never thought we'd get another mother character, right? There's Kumatora. We already have her. Pretty much the only fuckable character in the entire series. Everyone's a clay model or a child. Or like a deadbeat, or smells bad with a limp, or is a dog. But here we have Gigas, the, the the psychic alien, proto Mewtwo. Just kidding. What did you think of Gigas and his gimmicks? I was thoroughly entertained by Gigas. Uh, I was thoroughly entertained by being, you know, led on for what felt like an entire year uh, up until Gigas's release. Uh, but yeah, uh, solid, solid. Uh, this, this all the joke is solid here. I think it's uh, it works very well as an April Fool's character, and uh, I I feel very strongly about not reacting to the the gigification of the entire room. Just have it be like you know, no one cares. It's just something that's happening. <laughs> but yeah, Bobo Bob probably wouldn't react. He would just be like, "What else would happen?" He can do that exact same thing. He's not impressed. He, sh- he should do that, where Bobo Bo just turns into the background. It's like, oh, we're doing this now? It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, like, watch this. <laughs> Igis's writer. She loved playing the game of, ooh, bet you'll never guess who I'm working on. One of the hints was, it's a character whose franchise already exists in Spinetti. And the other hint is that she was asking people okay, your character, do they have anyone that would care a lot about them in canon? And that shows up a lot in the somewhat extensive targeted dialogue this character has, where it uh, mentions characters that generally are unlikely to ever appear in Spinati. For example, Videl's, the one to Videl, mentions Mr. Sin. Don't think anyone's going to make him anytime soon. My, my poor sweet Videl is dead. <laughs> oh. Oh, boo. Why Videl. I better pray for Videl. Let me at him. <laughs> you get me in the ring with this that. This the last time you messed with the world champ. Gonna put you in a headlock. Gigas is scared of me. Gigas's guts went down. <laughs> Okay, yeah, if you don't know the gimmick with Gigas, if you've never played Earthbound, um, basically, Earthbound always has, like, unconventional final bosses where you sing melodies to them, or pray, or just uh, stand there and do nothing. Like in Mother 3. Um, you basically just fight the background. Gigas is like a psychic alien. He goes insane, and then, like, uh, you win with the power of friendship, because all the people you've met along the way pray for your safety. So he just does that in Spinati, and all the characters. Um, Supporting car- uh, supporting cast sort of pray for their safety, which is really neat. I honest, I, I was honestly really impressed. This, this is probably most ambitious April Fool's character this year, and it's I think it's personally pretty clever because it incorporates the crossover aspect. It's not just hey, look at me, I'm goofy. It's like it actually gives the other character something to do. So I, I really like this project. I'm impressed with it. Next up is uh, Kiko Kamen, which I guess is some. Some sort of common rider parody that I'm not familiar with, but I guess the joke is she's common rider but naked. Yes, do that any is a joke. Do either of you know more about this? I know that they actually appeared in Shonen Jump and have had like, uh, like more adaptations in both animation and live action than you would think. Does she get like Austin Powers censorship or something? 
I think they just don't draw any details whenever it's manga. And then when it's live action, it's usually um, of the adult nature anyway. It's a, it's a like, plus 18 OVA. But it's, yeah. like, the 80s, so... <laughs> yeah, Gecko Common is a... Is literally a direct parody of Gecko Common. Uh, and this... I think, I think Gona Guy, the creator of this, like, he made this character as, like, a joke. He, like, submitted it to his publisher. I was like, wouldn't it be hilarious if this was was like the thing I was writing. His publisher was like, uh, that's hilarious. Uh, when's the next chapter? So, uh, Kekko Common took on a life of her own. What, what does, what does Kekko mean? Kekko. <laughs> Is that naked? Uh, I don't know. It's not even written with like any kanji. It may just be a word, word that doesn't mean anything, like a title. I know, I know. There's like a a, a keku or a keko that means that like um, to slack off from work, <laughs> to play hooky, but because that's where uh, keking from sl- like slacking from Pokemon comes from. It's probably unrelated. Apparently, Nord, any thoughts? Apparently, it might mean splendid, nice, wonderful. Oh, oh, oh indeed, she's very wonderful. 1974 <laughs> was her manga. Ooh. Um, this is this character is the perfect like litmus test for does your character react to other characters not wearing everything at game start, which is an oddly specific situation, which is usually reserved for the player character not having put on enough items. I just Overall, targeted her directly. I don't know, man. <laughs> Overall, how I do everything. Overall, uh, funny, well executed idea. Enough yeah. dialogue that the gimmick doesn't get old. Like, like the character doesn't get old quickly. It's it's simple, effective, and and sexual, yeah. which is a lot better than just being like obnoxious. It works. Yeah, for me. It, I think that's a good summary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And final, and, and finally, we've we've made it to the end here. I don't know about you, but I can't see any more characters to talk about. Like, I can't see anything here. I think it's just time to, to end, right? I mean, there's clearly no third character here. Do you see her? Just a bunch of floating clothes. I don't see what the big right, deal it's, is. It's Toru. It's, it's, to, it's Toru Hagakure. Is that it? Yep. Toru, Hagu, Toru Hagakure. Yeah. The invisible girl, the permanently invisible girl from My Hero uh, Academia. She apparently cannot turn visible. (laughs) So that's the joke. And as she strips, she becomes less and less visible. Here's a wonderful image from her naked stage. Do you like it? (laughs) Oh my. So much detail. Getting hot and bothered. (laughs) Apparently this character makes heavy use of pipelines to get all the transparency and the... Or that, that might be like custom work. To like get like the backs of her stockings and things. From what I gather, she was an absolute nightmare to make with pipelines. Isn't that ironic? You really shouldn't have to put this much effort into an invisible character. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the look she goes with the most in the show, which always felt a bit odd to me. That like canonically, her hero costume is just gloves. Either of you two have any uh? Thoughts on her? The the joke is there. She she's invisible. You can't see her. I mean, she's an actual. She's like she's an actual character in uh, My Hero Academia with you know thoughts and dreams and all that good stuff. Uh, so I guess on the like, it's one of those characters. Like I think there's been some back and forth. That's like, hey, uh, couldn't she be done seriously? The you know, camp was like, hey, well, she's invisible, so she should be a joke. So, yeah, I think it works for a kind of one-off joke, but uh, also it's like, this is very silly. I think there are, so. I think she got reports of like, please make her an actual character. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. even though she's permanently invisible, there's like, under a specific set of circumstances, she can be seen, and we know what she looks like. And, you know, it's uh, my hero academia 
uh, girl. So people are like, so it's a, it's designed to, to you know, yeah, people are crazy. People went crazy when the like canon look was revealed, even though it's just, yep, she sure is a girl. Yeah, if we had Would no she idea, have, like, long hair down to her shoulders, at least. I don't know. Whatever. If I'm remembering correctly. Well, she has this was hair. this was a mouthful of an episode. Uh, we didn't cover a whole lot, but I think we covered it pretty much in depth. And, uh, you know, it's episode 69. It should be a little special. It should be on the lengthier side. And I'm glad to have uh, the two of you with me. Nord, thanks as always for coming in clutch to, to sub in as the co-host whenever Namasp is indisposed. And just kidding. You're welcome. I'm not kidding when I say that you do some great work and it's also nice to have you on. Do either of you have any final thoughts? Or any people that you'd like to 69? Aqua. Based? Based? Pretty much. Yeah. I just want to thank all the lovely people uh, at home for supporting the weird things that I do. And uh, <laughs> hope you're all looking forward to the, the next characters I've got locked and loaded, ready to go for... For when uh, you finally get off your asses and sponsor role Maria. You're actually held back by the rule of only two characters on testing, aren't you? I, I could be doing so much at once. And I mean, look, they tell it. Look, let me come, come, come closer. I got a little secret for you people. I want to tell you something. I'm going to whisper this in your ears, guys. They... You can only have two characters on the testing roster, but they can't stop you from working on more than two characters at a time. They can't stop you. What are they going to do? Come to your house and stop you? They can't do it. They can't stop me. Nothing can stop me. Well, actually, with the newest version of the character editor, we are tracking your IP right now. Lock your doors. Well, they can't stop you from working on more characters, but I can stop this recording. Nord, Nord, report in. Oh, oh, we've lost him. Lost, lost, or just lost? He has expired. What is it with these co-hosts? They all mysteriously disappear while I endure. That's not suspicious at all. I mean, it's weird. It's weird how they all die in completely unrelated accidents. Someone should look into these. Well, before he talks about Kingdom Hearts lore for an hour, up oh, here he is. I was going to say maybe we can talk about Mega Man lore together. <laughs> he's he's back. Let's, let's stop talking crap about Nord. He's back. <laughs> Hate that guy. <laughs> oh geez. Oh shit. Oh, we're live. Oh. Well, speaking of bullying men, just kidding. Would you like to talk about Maria? Oh, I would From love to talk about Maria under the bridge. 